You are listening to an update on a monster about to hit Florida, Milton, and that update coming for the President of the United States, the Vice President of the United States there at the White House. So many experts now around the same table, whether in person there at the White House or in the case of Madam Vice President Kamala Harris virtually listening in to the updates. And the reason they are doing that in real time right now is because information is power, and in this case, information is power that can save lives. So the world watching, the nation watching, as these experts inform the president and the vice president about Milton as it gets ready to make landfall, you are hearing from them often the word local. And so the best service we can give to those of you who may be in Florida listening to us in the palm of your hands, the best information we can give you is to, is to echo what you're hearing over and over, and that's the word local. Listen to your local officials there. They will get you to safety. So as we dip in here to let you know what you're listening into, we just wanted to frame that. We think it's important that we go back and continue listening in on this conversation. The consequential damage this storm can do. I mean, this, this is it's going to enter Florida on the west as a hurricane and leave as a hurricane. And that's, that's, that, that's pretty unusual. Anyway, thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we will move on now to the National Weather Service Director, Ken Graham. All right. Thanks, Liz. I appreciate it. And I uh, wanted to thank Administrator Chris Well for, for everything through this. And Dr. Brennan as well. The Hurricane Center has been really focused on this and on it with such great forecast uh, the whole way. I just wish we could uh, minimize those impacts, but that doesn't look like what's going to happen. So, Mr. President, Madam Vice President, we continue to work at the National Weather Service with our federal, state, and uh, local decision makers during the storms. Um, look, we actually have our scientists embedded with FEMA, uh, the state and local emergency operations centers. And we also um, have our scientists embedded with the U.S. Coast Guard uh, District 7 to really help out with these, these decisions to make sure they're right there to answer the questions as they come up. Uh, they're covering really the subtleties, as, as you've mentioned in this forecast. Uh, Dr. Brennan mentioned those small changes can make a big difference. Little wiggles really do matter. Those small wobbles make a difference in the storm surge. And all these big storms, they wobble and wiggle all the way in. We'll, we'll see that happening as this gets closer to, to landfall. So as Administrator Criswell said, listen to those local officials. I can't stress enough, you know, 30 years with, with NOAA, 30 years in the Weather Service, this is a particularly dangerous track. People really need to be getting into their, their safe locations as uh, the impacts start deteriorating really quickly over the next few hours. Words really matter in, in these storms. Even if the winds uh, decrease somewhat near landfall, we really try to avoid uh, words like weaken. Uh, it really gives a false sense of security to the public. So we really want to stress that no matter what happens to that, uh, the, the wind speed in the system, catastrophic uh, impacts will result either way. The size and the wind speed, um, the actual size of it will be expanding, as Dr. Brennan was saying. So much of that impact will cover uh, most of the peninsula. And uh, Mr. President, like like you said, Milton, think about it. I just I just goes over my my mind over and over. Milton will enter as a hurricane and exit as a hurricane. So you'll see damage from uh, the landfall point on the, on the west coast, and you'll see damage on the east coast as well. So it's really important to focus on those impacts. Uh, again, seeing those impacts on both coasts. Uh, we're really starting to see the impacts as we speak. I, I was just looking at the radar before doing this uh, this meeting here, and we've got tornadoes already touching down in some spots in Florida, and some have been, have been confirmed um, that have touched down as well. And about 90% of those tornadoes occur on that right front quadrant uh, of a tropical system. So we're really, uh, our folks are at the Weather Service are on duty 24 hours a day, watching that radar to make sure that we could get those warnings out quickly to people so they, they can take cover. And as uh, Dr. Brenna said, think about it, Mike, right, 140 uh, miles wide. Now we're 200, and we expect it to be greater than 240 miles away from the center with these winds. So that's a huge area uh, that we can see some of those that damage. Very concerned about the storm surge, and I wanted to double down on something. It's not just, you know, Tampa Bay with that 8 to 12-foot uh, forecast or 10 to 15 down to Boca Grande. 
I mean, you could see five to eight feet of storm surge all the way down to Chakaloski. Think about Fort Myers, Naples, well away from that center. We just got to really keep reminding people they're not safe, even though you're not, you know, not near the center of, of the storm. So we'll continue to, to, to really message that as we can. The other part of this, flooding could last a while. So unlike other areas with elevation, there's not much elevation in, in Florida. So some of these rivers are going to be slow to drain. Um, some of these rivers could stay up for about a week after the storm, and the storm surge will act as a blocker to, to drain some of that rain from, from the inland area. So that could really be uh, add some challenges to some communities with these the flooding and recovery efforts as some of the roads will be pretty impassable. So, you know, I was, I was looking at this, Mr. President, Madam Vice President. Yesterday I said the clock was ticking. Um, today I'm saying the alarm bell is going off. People really need to start getting into their safe place. Um, and as always, the Weather Service remains on duty 24 by 7 to, to make sure decision makers have all the information they need and the updates to this storm. Ken, I'd like to focus on one thing you said. I don't think most people would think it, but, you know, the idea that uh, sometimes it takes days for rivers to crest after a major storm like this. Are there any particular areas of concern that you've, you've that are related to this type of flooding? And how long do you think the flooding conditions could last? In other words, I think people think once, once the winds are died down and gotten through that, okay, we're all set. But these rivers flooding are consequential, and that takes time, right? It, it takes time. That storm surge pushes up every nook and cranny uh, of, of Florida. So it goes up bays, goes up rivers. It fills in all these areas. And then you add that incredible amount of rainfall, and that rain can't drain because uh, the storm surge has it blocked. So just really looking at some of the areas in Hillsborough River, um, Alafia River, uh, the Peace River, some of these type of traditional places that could flood, uh, are, we really got to watch those those areas and those and communities. So it takes quite a while for that water to drain. Thank you very um, much. Hey, Ken, I have a question for you. You, you mentioned words matter, and um, I know there is a lot of um, media following this this briefing. So there have been, um, it, we've gone from a cat five to a cat four, and the language that a lot of folks have been using is downgrade, but it sounds like you're cautioning us that that may communicate a sense that the danger is lessened when in fact it's not. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know a lot of folks are watching right now and would love to have your feedback on how we should be talking about this. Yeah, we need everybody that communicates to the public to be on the same page with the words, because I've 30 years of doing this, I've seen this so many times, people will think, oh, it was a cat five, now it's a cat three. That's not a reason to relax. That's not weakened, that's not diminished. That means that we've expanded the wind field. The impacts don't change associated with that. And I've seen this in Hurricane Florence and other historic hurricanes. So we have to be mindful uh, of the words that we use and focus on those impacts. Those impacts haven't changed no matter what the, the wind speed does over the next uh, 24 hours. Thank you, that's very helpful, thank you. Thank you, Director Graham. Uh, we'll go now to Secretary Mayorkas, the Secretary of Homeland Security. Ali, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Liz. Uh, Mr. President, Madam Vice President, if I can just pick up on um, the important phrase, the words matter, I want to thank you for the strength and moral clarity with which you have been speaking to bat down false information that is being spread. That false information is only hurting survivors in need of help. And it is also hurting the first responders who are so bravely risking their lives to deliver that help uh, to uh, the survivors. Mr. President, Madam Vice President, we are executing on your directive to not only rely on FEMA to provide emergency relief, but to draw upon other resources throughout the Department of Homeland Security and throughout the federal government, throughout your administration. I know you will hear from the Commandant of the United States Coast Guard, Linda Fagan. The United States Coast Guard has deployed almost 1,300 personnel to Florida, not just for search and rescue, but also to ensure the safety and security of the port of Tampa, which is a critical lifeline uh, for supplies that are needed uh, by Florida and, and elsewhere. I want to also say that our U.S. Customs and Border Protection has devoted search and rescue uh, personnel, as well as other parts of our department. To give you just a quick snapshot of some of the resources that are devoted from other parts of the administration, the Department of Defense is providing search and rescue, commodity movement, commodity distribution, 
and security to Florida. We already have 1.5 million meals and 2.8 million liters of water ready to provide to people in need. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is providing temporary power, temporary roofing, debris removal support, and engineering expertise. The U.S. Forest Administration is also providing debris removal. This is absolutely critical so that our search and rescue personnel can reach the people in need and provide them with the humanitarian relief upon which they rely. Health and Human Services is providing hospital and health-related support. The Small Business Administration has dedicated 137 personnel to assist people who have lost or whose businesses are destroyed to get them back up on their feet and understand what resources are available to them. We have an entire administration dedicated to this effort at your direction. And with that, I'll pause. Hey, uh, Ali, uh, Mr. Secretary, um, do you have everything you need from all the uh, federal departments and the agencies in support of this response? Is there any, anything lacking? We, we certainly do have all of the resources. We are well positioned to continue to respond to Hurricane Helene, to respond to Hurricane Milton. Mr. President, we are meeting the moment and meeting the challenges because of the extraordinary people who have spoken before me. Well, I, you know, I want to thank the governors. They've stepped up. You know, all this disinformation going out about how, you know, we're devoting all this money to migrants and we're, I mean, all the, even one congresswoman suggesting that I control the weather and implying that I'm sending it to red states. I mean, it's stuff off the wall. It's like out of a, a comic book. But, you know, people, when they're in trouble, or for example, and I asked this to the, our administrator, they said that you get $750 and that's it. You lost everything, you get $750. Uh, that's that's not that's not it. That's just you give you immediately what you need to get by the next day to get a prescription to get a whatever. Um, uh, is is are you getting calls already about what we're going to be able to deliver for people who get in trouble? Uh, we we are, uh, um, Mr. President. Let, let me say that you know one of the false uh, narratives is that uh, the federal employees who are actually delivering assistance will take an individual's land. And that is causing in individual survivors not to approach the people who are there to help and obtain the relief to which they are entitled and that we have available to them. And the vice president knows very well, as a former prosecutor, that false information only is fuel for the criminal element to exploit individuals in positions of vulnerability. And Madam Vice President, your words at the outset were so very important for that reason. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you and the folks in your agency um, working with FEMA, NOAA, and all the federal agencies. I, I've seen, I've been on the ground, and the work that you all have been doing to coordinate with local and state law enforcement and first responders has been outstanding. It really does show the best of the kind of work that we do in a moment of crisis to work together. So I applaud the, the folks that work with you and your leadership in that regard. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Thank you, Secretary Mayorkas. Uh, we'll go now to Admiral Linda Fagan, the Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, Madam Vice President. And I want to assure you that the Coast Guard is ready to respond. We continue to monitor the storm closely and are mindful of how dangerous and devastating the storm is and the potential uh, to the region, which is still recovering from Hurricane Helene. Uh, my senior field commanders are well integrated with both the state and local emergency responders and have stood up incident commands. We continue to serve personnel and assets from across the country into the region. And I want to highlight how we prepare for storms. And so we have people in helicopters and aircraft and boats and cutters that would have been in harm's way for the passage of this storm. And we have sortie moved those people and assets out of harm's way for the storm. They are ready and positioned to begin to move back into the region as soon as it is safe to do so. 
In addition, the aircraft and ships and boats include shallow water boats, medical teams, pollution response teams, crisis support teams. Our top priority is saving lives and safeguarding, safeguarding the marine transportation system. This also includes responding to any pollution incidents. We will begin to move back into the region as soon as it is safe to do so, with our primary initial focus being life-saving work and reopening the ports to re-enable the flow of commerce. I want to uh, focus just for a minute on the Port of Tampa, which is the largest port in Florida. And depending on the, the impacts of the storm, there could be some uh, impacts to the port and commerce flow. We will conduct overflights as well as bring ships into the region to ensure that the channel in the harbor is clear and safe for commercial traffic. We will work with the Army Corps of Engineers and others to do those assessments. We'll work to reestablish the aids to navigation constellation and work with the pilotage in the area to ensure that ships are able to move safely in and out of the port of Tampa. We'll also need to ensure that the port has electricity for handling of cargo and cargo flows. So I share this with you, Mr. President, because we are uh, myopically focused on regaining commerce flows into the Port of Tampa once the assessments are able to be made. It does take a little bit of time, but we will move with all urgency to ensure uh, that Tampa is reopened for commerce and commercial uh, flows. Uh, we continue to monitor the storm uh, closely. And a number of our briefers have spoken on the, the need to heed the evacuation or, orders. And just like to emphasize that my first responders, and as one of the critical first response agencies pours a hurricane response like that, my first responders have moved out of harm's way and are not in the path of storm. They are ready for immediate reconstitution into the area, and you will see them moving quickly. But as the storm effects come on, uh, people really uh, need to need to move into uh, safe positions so that uh, they do not lose uh, lose their lives. Mr. President, your Coast Guard is ready to respond, and uh, we are uh, well positioned for that. Thank you, sir. Admiral, uh, one of the things that I don't know whether people have not been through any kind of hurricane in the past may not understand is that when uh, the rainfall and the flood surge are significant, but these elevated water level levels are likely to be accompanied by large and destructive waves. It's not just the water rising, there's significant waves. And what do you anticipate, if, uh, if anyone else wants to respond, what do we anticipate in terms of the wave damage that's done, not just the water rising, but these waves, large waves coming in? Sir, I'll just touch on the, the impact of the, of the water and uh, the, just the flow and significance of any kind of increased uh, water flow, storm surge, whether it's wave driven or otherwise, it creates uh, conditions that are incredibly uh, hazardous uh, to life. Uh, you, people can't uh, swim or save themselves, which again, just emphasizes why it's so critical that uh, people evacuate and get themselves out of harm's way and that allows them for the assessment with regard to any property or property impacts. I know search and rescue is obviously the number one priority immediately after the storm, but we know that the Port of Tampa is critical, critical for the state and the state's economy and the region as well. What can you and the Army Corps of Engineers do to get the port quickly reopened once this storm passes through? Is thank, thank you, Mr. President. We're already in conversations with the Army Corps of Engineers aligned on the need to begin those assessments as quickly as possible uh, to determine whether there are any impacts from the storm or not and regain and reopen the Port of Tampa. Uh, the Port of Everglades is also a critical port on the east coast of Florida. The Port of Everglades remains open for fuel tankers to ensure that that commerce continues to flow into the state from other uh, ports that are not uh, in the direct uh, impact of the storm. But, sir, I assure you, we in the Corps of Engineers are already in conversation with regard to what it will take to reconstitute the Port of Tampa, and we will lean into that work as quickly as possible. Thank you, Admiral. Appreciate it. 
Common Dan, I, I echo the president's words. Thank you for what you and the men and women of the Coast Guard have been doing in response to Hurricane Helene and now this, and um, your emphasis on the importance of the, the port in Tampa is critically uh, important to recovery. Um, so thank you for all the work that you are doing. I know that resources are spread thin in terms of your folks being on the ground in every area right now, and you're doing an extraordinary job. So thank you for that. Thank you, Madam Vice President. To each of the dedicated professionals on this screen, we are truly in your debt and in debt to your teams for what they are doing right now to prepare for and respond to what is coming to Florida this evening. With that, we will conclude the public part of this briefing. And if you'll just stay on the screen for a few minutes, we can, uh, can I say one closing have further thing? conversation. Of course, Mr. President. Pass on to your folks how much we respect and understand a lot of these folks are risking their lives. Yes. They're risking their lives to help other people. I mean, this is Americans helping Americans in ways that when, you know, it's, to me, it's a measure of who we are as a nation when we see this happen. And it constantly happens. Americans stepping up to help other Americans and risking their lives. So thank all these first responders. It really matters. Really, from the bottom of our heart, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sorry. We're ready. Mr. President, what's your message to Donald Trump? Thank you for being out. 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 Thank you for approaches Florida. Think of Florida like a catcher's mitt. It's about to catch hell. That's why Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis talking to his viewers and his followers. We got a chance to catch some of that video. Let's listen into what Ron DeSantis had to say. Good afternoon. We are bracing for major impacts from Hurricane Milton. It is going to hit uh, the western part of the state, most likely by tonight around 11, midnight, early morning on Thursday, has actually picked up some speed. So just know that we are uh, less than 24 hours out from a major impact, actually last, probably less than 12 hours out. Uh, so that's going to happen. Now, there's a lot that's been going on. One of the things that we have done uh, to prepare for this storm is what we've done in every storm since I've been governor, but we're doing it in the most robust way we've ever done it and that is uh, pre-stage all these power resources. You see these linemen that are behind me. Uh, this is one of the processing sites here in Lake City uh, for Florida Power and Light. We've had linemen come from all over the continental United States. California, people are coming. Uh, others have come. So we will have uh, over 50,000 linemen uh, that are pre-staged in the state of Florida. As soon as the storm passes, uh, they are going to go to work. And look, if you are in the path of this storm, uh, you are most likely going to lose power. So just prepare for that. Know that that's something that's likely to happen. If you are going to use a generator, make sure you're using it properly. Do not run your generator inside your home. The generator must be operated outside your home. Keep it away from any door or window. Uh, but all these folks are going to be brought to bear uh, to be able to get the power back on as soon as humanly possible. We just did Hurricane Helene. That was 2.4 million restorations as fast as it's ever been done in the history, I think, probably of all hurricanes in, in, the, in the U.S. This one coming on the heels of Helene, where you still have hundreds of thousands of people out of power in other parts of the country, like North Carolina and Georgia, you have a lot of linemen who are working in those areas. So the fact that we got fifth, over 50,000, that in and of itself is a big deal, but especially considering that you have a lot of people that are still at work in the aftermath of Helene in these other states, uh, it's really, really remarkable. So you will likely lose power if you're in the path of this storm. Just be prepared for that. Have a plan to deal with it. Uh, but just know that we've got uh, huge numbers of assets that are here 
ready to go, uh, and they are going to go as soon as it's safe to do so. The other thing that is worth pointing out, it's a lot of focus, understandably, on the west coast of Florida. That's what's going to see the really significant storm surge, particularly where the storm makes landfall and just south uh, of the eye wall is going to likely lead to the most significant storm surge. The way these storms go, they go counterclockwise. If you're on the north side of the storm on the west coast, it may be that that pushes water away from the coast. That's possible depending on how the storm goes in. Uh, right now, the track is that it's going to enter the west coast of Florida and then go almost horizontal across the state, maybe a little east, northeast, and then come out maybe in like southern Brevard County. Look, this can all change in the next you know, six, eight, ten hours. But what will happen on the east coast of Florida is you will have the possibility for storm surge there. It may not be 10, 15 feet like we could get on the west coast, but it's going to kind of be the opposite. If you're on the southern part of the storm, a lot of the storm is going to push the water away from the east coast. But if you're on the northern side of the storm, the counterclockwise, it's going to bring surge in. So places like Brevard, Volusia, Flagler, St. John's, you know, you're likely to see surge. You're likely to see, I and mean, we've had issues on the coast there anyways with erosion and whatnot. So just understand that is going to be something that could happen. It's not just about where it makes landfall. It's going to barrel across the state of Florida. It's going to exit on the east coast of Florida, and that also can produce some storm surge. So just make sure if you're on the east coast of Florida that you understand this is not just a west coast event. Uh, the major effects for surge will, will be on the west, but there is going to be impacts far inland and on the other coast in the state of Florida. The fuel situation, I know when the the um, initial evacuations went out on Monday and then even on Sunday when people were anticipating massive run on gas. People were, were crowding the stations. You had long lines. A lot of the gas stations ran out of fuel. Uh, we have not run out of fuel overall. Uh, when those, sta when those uh, stations go through it much quicker than normal, they, they don't have the same delivery schedules that could keep up, so they got to flex. So what we've done is, one, we've got 1.6 million gallons of diesel on hand just for the state of Florida and 1.1 million gallons of gasoline for the state of Florida. So that's just us. They're still bringing uh, fuel out of the ports. The, the ships are not coming in, but the dockside operations have been going. Now, I'd imagine Manatee, Tampa, probably not at this point, just given what's happening. East Coast, that's likely dockside going to slow down, too, uh, as, as the storm approaches. But we have to try to overcome, uh, had Florida Highway Patrol uh, facilitate 106 long-distance fuel tanker escorts. So they got the sirens. They're bringing those, the, those gas into the gas stations. And they've done almost a million gallons of gas with that. So I appreciate what they're able to do for that. We may have interruption in fuel delivery into Port Manatee, into Port of Tampa, depending on the damage from Milton. And we will work. You've been listening in to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis following a White House briefing of other leaders talking about response to that hurricane, that monster called Milton that is now spinning its way, ready to hit Florida in just a matter of hours. We are getting a masterclass in leadership and response to a storm that by all accounts can and will likely prove deadly. Storm surge is going to be a huge problem. You see the waters here behind me. They're already beginning to swell. They're already beginning to be rough. And a lot of people are saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. So when we come back, we're going to be talking more about Hurricane Milton. Also, we're going to talk about and listen in to word from the State Department. Overseas, so many Americans are trying to get out of Lebanon as the situation between Israel and Lebanon continues to grow more and more tense. So we'll continue watching our monitors for developments in Florida. There's not one person in the state of Florida who won't feel the impacts of Hurricane Milton. Plus, we'll go to Washington, D.C. and the State Department. Stay with us. You're watching CBS News 24-7 while we watch this. Continuing coverage as Hurricane Milton roars toward Florida. That massive storm, and you can see it spinning out there. Expected to make landfall, affecting thousands of people in just hours. Milton already stirring up all kinds of weather trouble in that region. In fact, look at this. It's a photo new to our monitors. A tornado 
hitting in the Everglades area of South Florida. This is just outside of Miami, a funnel cloud crossing the highway there. Proof that one weather system stirs up others. As we've heard our, our federal people and our state people from Florida and Washington DC talked about. And then this video showing us an emerging and growing story by the minute, thousands, look at that on the right, trying to evacuate bumper to bumper. Remember in Florida, they say this all the time, run from the water, hide from the wind, and they're doing that. Storm surge expected to come up to rooftops in many areas. So people are very much on the run in dozens of counties under those evacuation orders. Jess, we see the cars lined up there on the freeway. In every one of those cars, somebody, somebody, this weather story mm -hmm. is a people story. This is a community event right now as many people are evacuating. This has been so devastating already, seeing tornadic activity already in the forecast for us right now in the state of Florida as we are gearing up for one of the strongest hurricanes that has ever impacted this area in over a century. Now, as we take a look at where this hurricane is currently at and what it's doing for local community members all throughout the state of Florida, here's our current tornado threat. These are active tornado warnings widespread throughout counties in central and southern Florida, and that's going to be the trend for us with those outer bands continuing to sweep in right now in live time as we head into the overnight hours tonight, early morning hours tomorrow as this hurricane sweeps throughout the state of Florida. Let's dive into where it's at right now. This has been a unique storm for a lot of reasons. First things first, it only took 18 hours for it to go from a category one to a category five. To add to that, this is the only Atlantic category five hurricane that actually has that southeast motion. So here's where it's at right now. 145 mile per hour winds just before it makes landfall. That puts it at a category four right now. It's expected to decay just a little bit as it makes its way inland. But earlier in the show, we mentioned words matter. Just because you hear the word decay doesn't mean that this is a safe storm once it starts to lose its strength. Now, the center of it, of course, is going to lose some energy when it comes to those winds. However, it's expanding, now impacting many communities all throughout the state of Florida as it hits into the overnight hours tonight around 10 to 11 o'clock. That's when it enters that landfall. It continues to sweep over into the city of Orlando just south, heading into Melbourne, still at a category one as it enters the Atlantic into the early morning hours tomorrow, afternoon hours tomorrow. Now, storm surge is going to be a concern not only on the Gulf side, where we could see storm surge anywhere up to around 15 feet in local communities like Fort Myers, stretching all the way over into Sarasota, but we can also see storm surge on that back end too. So let's talk about that. About two to five feet expected south, closer to the Keys, but we make our way up into Port. Charlotte. This is where I'm concerned right now. Anywhere from 12 to 15 feet is expected as this hurricane continues to swirl its way in with heavy rain, damaging winds, and of course that storm surge is deadly for those community members all along the shoreline up into Sarasota, past that into Tampa Bay, where yesterday we were more concerned about the eye making its way landfall here. Now it's starting to shift. That track is going just a little bit more south. And as mentioned, we can see about two to five feet of storm surge on the opposite side once this hurricane re enters the Atlantic. I'm going to have more on this coming up in a bit and how this will impact those community members. But for now, over to you, Reed. All right, Jess, we want to show our viewers this image to our monitors from the International Space Station, looking at that storm from high, high above. An incredible view, an ominous view of what is expected to be a devastating storm. Let's go from that vantage point to down on the ground, Daytona Beach International Airport, also preparing for impact there. They are one of several airports in Florida that just now have suspended operations prior to Milton making landfall. Similar backdrop more than 50 miles west in Orlando. CBS News national correspondent Manuel Bajorquez joins us now. He's got the very latest. Manuel, Milton gets closer every minute. We can see that looks like you're getting wet now. What is happening? Even though you're a little more inland, you will be feeling the impacts as well. Yeah, this is likely to still be a hurricane when it comes through the Orlando area. As you noted, the rain has started here, but we have not seen the worst of Milton yet. That could happen in the overnight hours. And the big concern here is not necessarily storm surge, but still the risk of flash flooding from all the rain that's supposed to hit the Orlando area. Already this morning, the airport here in Orlando ceased operations at 8 a.m. No more commercial flights in or out until they are able to safely operate. The theme parks also adjusting their hours today. Disney closing at about 1. 
the other parks here, SeaWorld, Universal, saying they would adjust hours and likely all of those parks will remain closed tomorrow. What you have here in Orlando is a combination of residents who are hunkering down looking for gas in these very last hours before it hits, but also visitors who may become stranded, who maybe weren't able to get out, having to hunker down at hotels or shelters and evacuees from the West Coast who are trying to get away from the storm surge are staying here. Many of them said they stayed there during Helene, but that was so bad, and this storm is anticipated to be even worse. They did not want to take their chances. Reed? So we also understand that the airport there is going to be available for emergency planes and personnel in the Orlando area, at least. Have you noticed people preparing from that vantage point, or are most people just evacuating? Yeah, you know, uh, what we have seen is most people just trying to get to higher ground. Yes, the airport is closed to commercial flights, but there's a hotel in that airport. And there we talked to people who said, look, in 2022, when Ian just kind of brushed this area, they had flooding in their homes. And so these low-lying areas of Orlando, people are not wanting to take their chances there again. So they've gone to places... Uh, higher ground hotels that are uh, bigger and tougher buildings to ride this one out. Um, memories uh, just flash back from all of those painful uh, storms that people have endured. Ian did so much devastation, not only in Orlando with flooding, but of course you remember to Fort Myers, and Fort Myers might get another direct hit. Uh, not direct, indirect, I should say, but a bad hit when it comes to the storm surge that could come with this storm there. So really wide ranging impacts to the entire state almost when you consider the fact that down in the Broward County area, South Florida, you're already seeing those tornadoes spin up as well. Evan, coast to coast and streaming worldwide, this punctuates what we say is our heartbeat. We are live in your communities. Manuel Bohorkas, please be safe. Thank you so much for telling the story of thousands there in Orlando. When we come back, more coverage as hurricane barrels its way towards Florida. But also, we're going to be talking to what's happening in the White House press briefing room. They're going to be talking about hurricane response, but so many other things to talk about, not the least of which a reported call between President Joe Biden and the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. We're back after the break. Our eyes are on the impacts of Hurricane Milton, but very quickly, we want to get you this. New details about today's phone call between President Joe Biden and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. You see the photo right there. That is the conversation happening in real time. We have that image of the president holding that critical conference with Netanyahu today. So people at the State Department are also reacting to that phone call and the hopes for a diplomatic resolution in Lebanon. Let's listen in to a State Department briefing that happened just moments ago. It's very clear that the diplomatic resolution that we want to see is the full implementation of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1701. That has been our priority, and it's what you've heard from the United States going back to the immediate days after October 7th when Hezbollah began launching rocket attacks against Israel. Um, we ultimately do want to get to a ceasefire, and we do want to get to a diplomatic resolution, and we want to get to a diplomatic resolution that includes Hezbollah finally after 18 years, fully complying with what that Security Council resolution called on them to do. And those are things that they have not done over the past 18 years since 1701 was adopted. Setting down their arms, withdrawing to uh, north of the Latani River, and it is their refusal to comply with that Security Council resolution that has gotten uh, us to the, the place that we are today. So, yes, we do see um, uh, Israel having the right to conduct these limited incursions to degrade Hezbollah's capability, to delay, degrade its infrastructure, um, to uh, inflict losses in terms of the number of militants that it has available to fight against Israel and to, to launch terrorist attacks on civilians, and uh, ultimately to weaken Hezbollah. And we would like to see the outcome of that being Hezbollah, be Hezbollah finally agreeing to do what it said it would do 18 years ago. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, just on the 1701 point, but the, so you're calling for, you're, you're now, I think in the last sort of two weeks, you've, you've started using 1701 uh, talk, as, a, as a sort of re repeated talking point, but in the actual 
three-week ceasefire that you were proposing two weeks ago, uh, that was a, sort of a temporary ceasefire that would hopefully lead to a, a resolution. But no longer do you want uh, an immediate cessation of, of violence to move to a diplomatic we solution. Do want, we do want to ultimately get to a ceasefire. As I said, we ultimately want to get to a diplomatic uh, resolution. The situation on the ground has changed from where we are two weeks ago. And we hope that this change in situation on the ground will change Hezbollah's calculation, ultimately. Because even when um, we were putting forward that ceasefire proposal and trying to get to the full implementation of 1701, uh, I can tell you there were a lot of people, and you see, you see people publicly commenting on this, quite skeptical of whether Hezbollah, even at the end of a 21-day ceasefire, was going to fully agree to go back to the Latani River, given the fact that they have refused to do that for the past 18 years. Maybe their calculation will be different in the days and weeks ahead. That's the proposition that will be tested. Right. But now uh, there's, a, there, there are, there's a ground incursion, so the Israelis are also in breach of, of what would need to happen to be, to be in that. So are they willing to, to, to move back over the border if, in, the, in, the, in the event of a temporary cessation of, of fighting, not necessarily going all the way to the, the terms of 1701, but what you were calling for before? It seems that you're, so you're no longer calling for that, right? So the Israeli government will have to speak to what they will and uh, are not willing to do. But to be clear, when we say that we want to see 1701 implemented, that includes all the provisions of 1701. It doesn't just mean the provisions that apply to Hezbollah. It means Israel withdrawing south of the blue line as well. We want to see uh, every provision implemented, and that, include, that includes the provisions, as I just said, for Israel. And yesterday we spoke a bit about this uh, on the back of this video that Prime Minister Netanyahu put out where he's, you know, he's basically calling for Lebanese people to, uh, to rid their country of the, the scourge of Hezbollah. So you seem to be backing this campaign. That's the Prime Minister of Israel talking about these, these broader aims. Uh, you, you've come out in support of this campaign, but you seem to be basically supporting the, the, an effort to change the politics of Lebanon by force. So we want the Lebanese people to decide who their leaders ought to be. Bottom line, and that has been our position that continues to be position. We don't want to see any other government in the region dictate to the people of Lebanon who their leader is. We certainly don't want to dictate to the people of Lebanon who their leader is, and we're not going to. We want the Lebanese people to be able to do it, but we want them to be able to do it absent a terrorist organization putting a gun to their head, which is the situation that Lebanon has been in for decades now. Right. And so... Um, uh, we are hopeful that the stalemate that has existed in Lebanese politics for some time, that for the past two years has kept them from electing a president, because of Hezbollah's influence, because the way Hezbollah uses force to um, uh, make its influence known by threat inside Lebanese politics, um, we hope that the Lebanese, Lebanese political system can break that deadlock, and ultimately we hope that Hezbollah is degraded enough that they um, uh, are less of a force in Lebanese politics and that they agreed to uh, withdraw back up above the Latani River so 1701 can be implemented. Right, but whether you like it or not, Hezbollah is part of the Lebanese political landscape, right? So you are, you're, you're trying, you're, what the Israelis are doing is trying to change that landscape through, through force and you're supporting that. So this seems to be a very different approach to uh, calling for restraint, trying to get everyone on board with diplomatic uh, agreements. In the last two weeks, we've gone from that to, oh, maybe we could change the government of Lebanon through uh, a ground invasion. So we have always, always made clear that we think a terrorist organization should play no role in the government of any country, and especially a terrorist organization that has shown over decades that it is willing to use force and threaten force against the Lebanese people to accomplish its aims and to hold the people of Lebanon hostage. That is not a new position of the United States. That has been our position going back decades. It will always be our position that Hezbollah should not be able to or should not be allowed to use force against the Lebanese people to accomplish political aims. That hasn't changed. It's not going to change. And, and now, now these sort of broader aims raises a question. Um, you know, you are, what you've come out in support of is limited, uh, I guess, short-term incursions. You won't say uh, how short-term, but but how long can you uh, can this this operation continue with the goal of of uh, basically ridding 
Lebanese politics of Hezbollah. So we are in conversation with the Israeli government about uh, exactly those questions. Um, the goal that Israel is trying to accomplish is to push them back, be you know, uh, uh, away from the border. I, I, I think it's is a separate. Goal, I think, what's that? I mean, is I mean, that the goal? They seem to have that goal and other goals. That, that is their goal. I will say it is our goal to ultimately see the Lebanese people elect a, uh, their own political representatives. When it comes to Israel's military goals, I'm not going to make any forecasts. We're going to continue to have conversations with them about it. Do, do you believe that Israel's <laughs> military operations um, are being effective in such that they are bringing Lebanon closer to the place where it could politically raid its political system of Hezbollah? I wouldn't want to make any type of assessment today. We have seen so far on the ground limited ground incursions. Um, but as you heard me say previous times at this podium, we are also cognizant of the long history of Israel starting with limited ground operations in Lebanon, turning those into full scale, more full-scale ground operations, turning those into occupation, something that we are very clear we are opposed to, we are against. And so we're going to continue to have the conversations with the government of Israel about that because uh, I think it's quite obvious that there is a point at which what they're doing now turns into something different, and that has obviously obvious political effects inside Lebanon as well as humanitarian effects on the Lebanese people. And what is the U.S. definition of limited incursions? So what we have seen to date have been limited ground incursions, which is, the, which is, the, which is the, the Israeli troops going um, a short distance across the border, conducting operations, not pushing deep inside Lebanon. I, I, I'm not going to offer a, an expansive definition other, other than to say, we will watch what they're doing and make assessments um, based on the facts on the ground. But limited um, refers to the amount of land that they are going into in Lebanon, not the number of troops that they are deploying. Yes, at this point, it's the it's the amount of land. And so, and that's a great question because um, I think there was public reporting over the past few days that they were deploying <coughs> additional troops to Lebanon. If you look at what they were doing, they were deploying additional troops to widen their operations across a longer stretch of the border, not to deepen their push inside Lebanon. And those are two obviously very different things. Just one quick question. Um, we're seeing Israel's military operations in Gaza ramp up again this week. Does the U.S. support these renewed military operations in Gaza that are being conducted? We will always support their right to go after terrorist organizations. And that, of course, of course, includes Hamas, and that includes Hamas in Gaza. But we continue to have concerns that without a political plan, a, pl a, a plan for the day after in Gaza that includes a political path for the Palestinian people to realize their legitimate hopes and dreams and aspirations, Israel is going to be bogged down conducting these types of operations for some time to come. Um, with obviously obvious terrible humanitarian effects for the Palestinian people and with real s security problems for the Israeli people as well. Um, we do not think a plan to just continue conducting operations in Gaza in perpetuity is one that either benefits the Palestinian people or secures long Israel's long-term interests. But do you see any indication that that isn't their plan as of now? So we continue, we're in conversation with them. We would like to get back to the point of getting to a ceasefire, which would set the stages for an end to the war and would help answer this question about what the future looks like and what the day after looks like for uh, the situation in Gaza. As I've said, over the past few weeks, Sinwar has been unwilling to engage in any meaningful way in the, in the ceasefire talks. I think it is probably reasonable to conclude he's watching what's happening in the north. He's watching Iran's attacks. You are listening live right now to Matthew Miller at the State Department on the left side of your screen talking about the hopes for a diplomatic solution in Lebanon while at the same time saying um, that they way, would like Hezbollah out of power talk. and not in any yeah, sort of power in the governmental structure of Lebanon. Hezbollah seen as a terrorist organization backed by Iran. On the right side of your screen, you are seeing what is going to be a press briefing there in the White House press briefing room, where the administrator of FEMA will be popping up on that screen. You see the big TV right there. The administrator of FEMA is going to be addressing the press about the situation, the growing situation. Hurricane Milton is now barreling towards Florida. So much to talk about as we leave you these live pictures of Tampa and storm surge expected.